In the criminal justice system, deputy district attorneys represent the people. The prosecutors you are about to see and the cases they try are real. Nothing has been reenacted. In this case, you are going to learn of a family who's been living in fear. The reason, ladies and gentlemen, this family has been living in fear is seated in this courtroom. Right there, it's the defendant. Ms. Lito and the defendant, they've been married for 16 years. You're going to hear evidence that in August of 1996, Ms. Lito and the defendant began to argue. Ms. Lito was half on the bed, defendant standing above her, holding on to her with a fist, telling her to suck his, to orally copulate him. And when she doesn't do it, he punches her in the face. Four months later, it's four o'clock in the morning. The defendant is up using a power drill. He takes the drill and points it at her and says, how would you like me to drill one of your eyes? And then he hits her in the head with the drill. Then when he moves to hit her again, harder, she puts her hand up to block it and he hits the hand. She has a fractured bone in her hand. A couple days later, the defendant bursts in and grabs her by the hair, throws her on the ground and starts pounding on her. Punch, punch, punch. Now, let's talk about June 7th. This is the charged event. Ms. Lito's daughter, Lauren, hears her scream. Lauren runs up the stairs through the front door, and her mom is sitting there on the couch, and her nose is bleeding. There's blood, you know, around her mouth and her nose. The defendant says, I didn't do anything. There was no violence. She's making this up just to get me into trouble. She finally realized, I've had enough. Enough of this. Tell the defendant, enough. Let me just ask you some basic background questions. Mm -hmm. You're 17, all right? And your mom and dad have been married for 16 years. Yeah. All right, and so he's the dad you've known forever. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me, leading up to June of this year, what was your relationship like with him? Mm, he was nice to me, but I kind of stayed away from him. What was it that made you feel sort of distant from him, if you can well, even say? Well, the stuff that I saw with okay. my mom and dad fighting. How would it happen usually? Um, usually I'd hear yelling and then I'd always go out there and he'd stop because he would never do anything around me. That's how I always like had my power over him, like he wouldn't do it. And then I guess it changed when I got older. What sort of things did you see that made you know that she was actually hurt? Blood and bruises and scrapes and fat lips and kind of things like that. I just wanted to show you, here's my children. Cute. That's a good-looking family. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. All right, now let's talk about the preliminary hearing. How did it happen that when the police came out on June 7th or morning hours of June 8th, you told them the truth, and then at the preliminary hearing you told something different? It's, it's the family dynamic of being inside a family. I've known them since I was, you know, 13 years old. What were you afraid of? If you were to take the stand at the preliminary hearing and testify... Truthfully, what were you afraid would happen? I'm afraid of Michael. I'm afraid of what... You see, I, even though he's in behind bars, mm -hmm. it's still there, the fear. You were afraid before the prelim, but since then, you've come back to what we believe the truth to be. Why is that? I'm tired. I'm tired of being beat up. I'm tired of the verbal abuse. And he pushed my daughter. Okay. Well, we have a jury. Yay! What are they like? We have housewives, we have teachers, we have women who had been stalked by her husband for a while. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay, why is the teacher there? 
I don't mind teachers. Okay. I don't mind teachers. When it comes down to credibility calls, I like them. Okay, because they're used to judging credibility mm -hmm. of kids. Yep. I haven't had bad luck with teachers at all. That's great. That is quick with the jury. Good job, Kurt. We meet again? Yeah. How are you? Fine. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. We went through a series of events where he was trying to convince me to take him back and, and forgive him and all that. And I actually had to get a restraining order against him because he was harassing me. Did you feel you know? sorry for him? Did he seem pretty pathetic? Oh, very pathetic. Stacy, he could play the pathetic role so well. And, you know, it's unfortunate, but I always had, like, this weakness for that. I still do. I mean, I'm a bleeding heart. What's their relationship? They were married, but they've been divorced 18 months at the time of the offense. They have two kids. One was 14, one was 19. Okay. It, it's a long, long story, but he had a huge gambling problem, hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. And he had convinced her that he had buried some coins in the ravine. So he takes her to this ravine, and when they get, it's a horrible place. He had his backpack with him, and out of it he pulled her checkbook pad. He had her write him a check for as much as she thought she had in the account. Then he had her write out goodbye letters. He had her call people and say goodbye. And then as he was leading her, oh, he forced her to orally copulate him at two locations. Then as he was leading her down into even a darker, deeper part of the ravine, he went around some big boulder this way, and she, she was sort of more committed to the other way. And the minute he went down, she turned and, and scrambled up to the freeway. Wow. And, um, Saved your life, sounds like. It did. Under the tree is sort of the first spot. That's where he's going to do all the letters, the calls, all that stuff, the first, first oral cop. Then he takes her over to that second large bush over there, and the second oral cop occurs. And then they're heading down into this canyon area, and she said, I'm dead. So that's when she makes her break. She said she just kept thinking at any moment he was going to pick up a rock and smash her head in with it. That was going to be it. This whole place looks like Snake City. Oh, my God. Well. She had to be so scared. <laughs> it appears to me as though there's a confusion here between a planned crime and a premeditated intent to kill. And it would require basically more of a leap of faith than a leap of evidence or logic to support that there was an intent, premeditated and deliberated, to kill Jeanette Sherbaugh. It is the people's position and has always been our position that Mr. Sheerbaum did not plan for Jeanette Sheerbaum to leave the ravine on October 3rd. But she got away. He went to her house on October 9th to finish what he wasn't able to finish in the ravine. He comes in and he wants Jeanette. And he draws down on her at the bathroom window. She testified he was about three feet away. He pointed the gun directly at her. And she jumped into the bathtub. What's he do? He fires two shots into the bathroom door. How does he get her out of there? the same way he got her from point A to point B down in the ravine. I'm going to kill the children. And he says that to get Julie out of, the, of her bedroom, I might add. I'm going to kill your brother John. What kind of man can do that to his family? You have to have some pretty serious plans in mind if you can walk into a house and put a 9 millimeter loaded semi-automatic to the head of your 14-year-old. Now, maybe he wasn't the best marksman in the world, and thank God for that. But Thomas Sheerbaum wanted Jeanette Sheerbaum dead. And not because he hated her, Your Honor, because he loved her. There is an abundance of factors to indicate planning to support not only the binding over, but a finding of fact as to the premeditation. Defendant's motion to dismiss is denied. Trial date of September 17 is confirmed. Thank you, Your Honor, very much. So, how are you feeling? A little apprehensive. I, yeah. I don't like being, you know, I mean, imagine being attacked for all those years and now I'm going to be attacked again. Well, you know what, Anne? He is not going to be able to attack you like that. There's no way they're going to let that happen. Department 12, the Security Court is now in session. Please be seated and come to order. Mr. Earl, on behalf of Mr. Villa, you may now deliver an opening statement. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This case basically stems from an incident that happened on June 7th, earlier this year. Mr. Villa went to his ex-wife's house. 
They start arguing a little bit. Aunt Via that day had been drinking all day and was taking prescription medication. She said she'd been punched twice, and then apparently her and Mr. Via go out to the living room. You're going to hear from Deputy Stroll, the officer that came out on this case. He doesn't find a drop of blood on anything. You get punched in the nose twice, there's blood all over. Her credibility in this case is lackluster at best. Ladies and gentlemen, I think when you look at the evidence in this case, you're going to see she made up the story, she's a liar, and at the end, I'm going to ask you to find Mr. Villa not guilty. Thank you. Well, Mr. Mackles, you may call your first witness. The people call it Lauren Villa. Lauren, do you remember Easter of this year, 2001? Yes. Did something happen that prompted you to leave your bedroom? Yeah, I heard yelling. What happened next? My mom was telling my dad to leave, and my dad started coming towards her to hit her. And so I had tried to push him or get in between, and then he pushed me into the hallway closet. What gave you the impression that you needed to get in between your mom and dad? Because he was going to hit her. What gave you that impression? His fist. Lauren, I want to talk to you now about another date. Do you remember being home in the evening hours of June 7th? Yes. Jake's your boyfriend? Yeah. At some point that evening, did you and Jake leave? Yes. Tell us what happened when you got back. You parked the car. What did you do? Um. We started walking, and I heard my mom yelling. I got up to the door, and I asked my dad what he was doing. Did you talk to your mom at all? She told me that they were in the bedroom, and she didn't want to do something, so they got in a fight. Now, that something, did she ever tell you what that was? OK, let me ask you more specifically. You OK? Now, did she tell you more than he wanted her to do something? Something sexual. Did she say what happened after she refused? He hit her. Okay. Thank you, Lauren. Jeanette. Jeanette, it's Stacy. Hi, Stacey. Remember I had told you a while back that Tom's lawyer said, come on, this case should not go to trial. Right. So she offered three counts with the firearm allegation. And when you calculate that out, you get 25 years exposure. And at 85%, he would serve 21 years, eight months. I said that that wasn't sufficient, but I want to know what you think. Um, or do you need time to think? I mean, you don't have to tell me right this second. You may want to mull it over with a glass of wine and, and talk with the kids. Well, I'll talk about it with my family and with the kids. And okay. So, you know, we're getting to this point. What, what's it worth to you to move on? The first option, obviously, is we can go to trial. Chances are he would get a pretty sizable sentence. The other option is Stacy talk to the public defender. They may come back at the readiness hearing and say, we're ready to offer a plea bargain. If they do that, Stacy feels that they're probably going to try to get him around 20 years serve time. I may not be here in 20 or 30 years. You guys will. You guys are going to be the ones that are going to have to deal with when he gets out if he tries to contact you. So this is something we have to decide. There's no amount of time that he could do that would satisfy me, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. you, guys, you guys mean <laughs> everything to me. That's right. You know, and he took almost all of you away from me just like that. I don't think you should accept anything less than 25. We might have to go to trial if we want him to do more than 20 years. Right. Serve time. And that's definitely up to the kids. Yeah, I mean, so what do yeah. the kids think? What do you I'd much rather go to a plea bargain, but I don't want anything less than 25 years. You'd probably, want to go, maybe 30. You'd want to do a plea bargain so you wouldn't have to testify and all that? Yeah. You think 25 is long enough? Mm, not really, no. Would you rather go to trial? No. <laughs> <laughs> so you're willing to accept 25, then yeah, go to trial? Okay. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that, you know, John's future and Julie's future is secure. They don't have to constantly be, be looking, looking behind their back, right, and worrying and... Yeah, like Julie 
deadbolting herself in the bedroom every night because she's scared that he's somewhere in the area. That's horrible. That is yeah. so horrible. Do you Fine. still consider him your dad? Yeah. Yeah. You don't? No, not really. Do you, John? I don't. It's just some guy I try to ruin our life. Exactly. Ms. Longo, I want to talk to you about Easter 2001, around 11.30 or so in the evening. Did something happen that woke you up? Yes. I thought I heard a demolition crew up above my head. When's the next time you saw Anne after Easter? Two days later. She came over, she rang my doorbell, she brought me a bouquet of flowers, and she started apologizing for the noise that they had made, and she was crying. And I yanked her in literally pulled her in and as I pulled her in her jacket fell and I saw a bruise place on her arm. You said that on Easter you saw Mr. Villa leave the condo. I heard him go down the stairs. And he went out to his car. Yes. And you testified that Ann Villa followed him. She was trying to open the door of the car. And did you see Ann run into the car and start hammering on the side of the car with her own arm? No. You didn't see her ram into the car with her shoulder. No. Right? But that doesn't mean it didn't happen, correct? I can't say that. Okay. I didn't okay. see that. Okay. In August of 1996, did an argument erupt between Anne and the defendant? Yes. What did you do? I heard a sound, a loud sound, and it just pulled me in the room. After you heard this noise, what did you see? Anne was kneeling in front of the toilet where Mike was sitting. And his pants were down, and he wanted oral sex, and she didn't want to, and she said no very loudly. And stood up and tried to come out of the bathroom. Did you hear the defendant saying anything to Anne? Yes. What? Do you want me to use the exact words? Yes. Bitch, suck my... Okay, what's the next thing you remember seeing? Anne said no, came out of the bathroom, was walking then in front of the bed. Michael came out. They started struggling. They were then around the other side of the bed. He pulled her by the hair, hit her in the face, twisted her arm around her back, and threw her on the bed. Did you notice whether or not she was injured? Oh, yes. She already started developing bruises on her arms and her face. Did you discuss calling the police? Yes, and she begged me, begged me, sobbing not to. Did you call security after Mr. Villa left? I was concerned and with... Yes or no? No. And you already testified that you didn't call the police? Correct. Did you call for any medical attention for your sister? I tended to her wounds. Okay. Yes or no? We did not. Thank you. No further questions. On June 7th, tell us what you did when you first arrived. I contacted uh, Ms. Leto Villa. She relayed to me that she had been involved with a verbal and a physical confrontation with her husband. Was there anything else about her person that struck you? Uh, she had some dried blood on her face. Uh, I could see it in her nostril. And she had shown me a red mark and a welt on her left arm. Did you see any blood on her clothes or on the couch? No, I did not. Did you see any blood on the carpet? No. Did you see any towels with dried up blood in the living room when you first arrived? No. Did she tell you she'd changed clothes? Yes. Did you look in the dirty clothes bin? I, no, I didn't. I don't have a right to go through somebody's house. Did no. you ask to look in the dirty clothes bin? No, I did not. Did she take any medication in front of you? She did. And she'd been drinking by the time you got there, correct? She had the smell of alcohol about her person. Your Honor, I don't have any further questions. Have you talked to Ann? Yes, she seemed to be doing pretty good. She was, had a very rough weekend in terms of some nightmares and just obviously real concerned about what's going to transpire in the next couple days. And, you know, I think she really feels that if we do not get a guilty verdict, that he has the potential to get out and kill her. There's just a big part of me that just wants to say, this is a good case, it's a good trial, and we should just put it on and he should suffer the consequences. But there's so many factors, you know, there's kids, I'm worried about Julie. 
um, this would be a really ugly scenario. But if you were <laughs> representing him, you would recommend that he take the plea bargain? Absolutely. His attorney? I'd Definitely. tell him to take it and run. <laughs> <laughs> I would. Because I'd say the thing that's going to sink you is when your son gets up there and looks at you with those eyes, and the jury is going to pick up on that like nobody's business. So it's just a matter of Eugenia and what she has to say. If I'm considering making somebody who's looking at life a less-than-life offer, she has to approve it. Okay, so what do we got here? Well, Thomas Shearbaum. Mr. Shearbaum. Mr. Shearbaum, he's a bad boy. Yeah, it sounds like it. I think it's a strong case. I think the victim is very credible. She had a big family powwow, and their primary issue was we don't want him to get out when he's capable of doing anything. Basically, they want, you know, <laughs> Gumby, who can't contemplate and plot and hurt them. They said they wanted him to be around 80 years old when he got out, which is about an actual 30 years. We're looking in the mid-30s to 40s. Okay. I wouldn't make a specific offer. Okay. I'd say this is what we're looking at. Actual if, if, if that's if you if you are interested in that ballpark, let's talk a little bit more. If he doesn't want to plead to the things we want him to plead to, then we just say fine. Let's go to trial. How do you feel today? You look calm. Mm -hmm. A little tense. So do I. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> we all do. Yeah. It's just the nature of trial. Right. But um, you're going to do very well. I know okay. you will. Stay calm. You know the defendant's going to be sitting there. That alone is going to raise emotions, mm -hmm. as you know. We're set. I'm set. Ready to go. All right. Step right on through the gate and then have us, and then stop right there on the other side. Stop right here. Please, you're right here. Please. You shall only escape with the evidence you shall give in this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be done. I do. Box. Let me just step up into the witness stand. Ms. Villa, do you know a man by the name of Michael Villa? Yes. How do you know him? I, I'm married to him. Did he live with you from 1996 through November 2000? No. Where was he? In prison. In November of 2000, just last year, the defendant was released. Yes. Where did he go? To my home. June 7th, after the younger kids went to bed, did an argument begin? Yes. He wanted to have oral sex. It was always the same thing. And I was like, no, I, you know, I don't want to do this. What happened next? He started hitting me. He just was punching up in, in my nose area, my lip, my face right here, just punching me. My nose was cut. My lip was cut. I had blood all over the face. My, face, my nose was bleeding everywhere. Did you do anything to treat that? I held up um, a wet washcloth to hold it in. Did you call the police? No. Why not? Because if I called the police, then the family would get mad at me. When you refer to the family, what are you talking about? Michael's family. They would get mad at me. How would the you... police on Michael? How would you know they would get mad at you? Had that happened before? Because I've been through it. How are you? Doing okay? Yeah. How's she doing? She's doing all right. <laughs> She's doing good. She's doing real good. The defense attorney is going to try to ask you some questions that are not easy to answer. I mean, I've done that. Yeah. But they may ask you questions designed to just make you mad. The thing that's important for you to remember is definitely be yourself, definitely tell the truth, but know that the defense attorney has a job to do. Right. And this is an emotional time for you. Right. Okay, don't let them rile you up. Okay. Because that's a big part of their strategy. cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. You testified at the preliminary hearing in this case, correct? Yes. And you were placed under oath on June 25th, much as you were today? Yes. And it's your testimony here today that your testimony back on the 25th was untrue? Was what? Was not true. You lied at the preliminary hearing? I told the truth to the officer on June 8th. Okay, that's not my question, though. On June 25th, you lied under oath. To protect Mike. Yes or no, on June 25th, when you testified at the preliminary hearing in this case, you lied. Correct? 
I told what Michael told me to say. Okay, I'm going to move to strike as non-responsive. Sustained, stricken. Yes or no, ma'am, please respond to the question. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Leto, did you lie at the preliminary hearing under oath? Yes or no? It's okay, we pretty much all know the answer. You can say yes, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, thank you. How many beers did you consume on June 7th? Probably four. You testified at the preliminary hearing. The question posed to you is, what else happened after you were yelling and arguing? Your answer was, I started to feel dizzy. Question, what did you do then? Answer, I told him I had taken my medication, I had drank some beers, I started to fall down, and I needed some help. That's what you testified to, correct? Yes. You told Deputy Stroll, Mr. Villa hit you twice. He hit me more than twice, Mr. Earl. You told Officer Stroll that you were covered in blood from being hit? Yes, there was blood on my face, yes. Did you clean up before he got there? Yes. Did you take a wet towel to do that, or was it a dry towel? It was a towel that was dry, and I cleaned it up. When the officer arrived, did you show him the towel? No. He didn't ask to see it. Well, where was it if you were on the couch when he arrived and you were sitting on the couch when you had the towel? In my bedroom. How did I, the... I changed my shirt. You know, there, I, I changed my shirt. There was blood all over my shirt. And did he ask to see the bloody shirt? No. And you didn't point it out to the officer? No, he didn't ask me. Did you ever call him the next day? <laughs> Let me ask it this way. I'm not a crime investigator. I don't know. Who would think to do that when they're beat up? <laughs> Okay, I'll move to strike as non-responsive. Stricken. Mrs. Villa, this is not a debate between you and Mr. Earl. You are here to answer questions. Please do so in a direct manner. Mr. Earl, next question. Did you ever take the shirt and the towel to the police station? No. He never called anybody and said, hey, can you come back out? No. What happened to the shirt and the towel? <laughs> Where are they today? At my house. Have they been washed, changed, modified, deleted in any way? I do laundry. Now, you also testified at the preliminary hearing. You were asked, as a condition of his parole, he wasn't supposed to be at your house. Answer, correct. If you were so afraid of Mr. Villa, why didn't you just call the parole department and have him come and pick him up? His parents asked me not to call the parole department on Michael. Michael asked me not to call the parole department on Michael. You could have called parole, correct? You... I understand they didn't want you to, according to your testimony, but that didn't prohibit you from calling, if you really were that afraid, right? I don't understand. Yeah, I don't have any further questions for Ms. Via. So is the defense just going to be that the police officers didn't do a thorough investigation? I don't know. It seems pretty straightforward to me, but I just hate to predict. We have the defendant. What kind of damage could he do? And if he took the stand, he's at risk of being impeached with his domestic violence convictions, multiple strikes, his residential burglary, his petty theft with a prior. Ooh, prior? That must be another one. Bring him on. You were at home on the night of June 7th this year, correct? That's correct. What did you do when you arrived home? Um, as customary, uh, Gabriella comes running up and, you know, gives Daddy the big old hug. And, um, you know, we go through the what did you do todays and, and, and that kind of thing. And my son was showing me a couple things that we had been working on with math. After you were done looking at your kids' schoolwork and whatnot, did you put your kids to bed? Yes. What did you do after that? I believe at that point, Ann was in the kitchen making a drink, and she had a pill bottle, and she was had just taken a Xanax. Where did she go after you were in the kitchen area? She stumbled. I picked her up, and we went into the bedroom. Where was Ann when you got into bed? She had the pill bottle again. She had, was, was taking another pill. What did you do at that point? I went and laid down. Was Ann in bed with you at that point? She crawled up onto the bed, and I was kind of upset about the pills and she looked at me and she grabbed a blanket off of me and she said you're not even hard and I was like you know what did you do after she said that I stood up and I said you know what Ann I'm, I'm gonna sleep on the sofa you sleep here what did she do when you said that 
She got up. She went to use her arm for support. She got about a little bit up, and then that arm slipped, and her whole body kind of flipped this way um, into the into the dresser. You know, I, I don't want to seem uh, un, un, unfeeling, but it was it was funny. What did you do when she fell off the bed? I, I started cracking up. And when you laughed, what did Ann do? Well, man, you know, Ann does not like anyone laughing at her. And she came at me, and she had, uh, she was mad, mad, mad. Did you tell her at some point you were leaving? I told her I was leaving. I said, that I'm leaving for good. I'm sick of this. She said, if you, if you effing... If you effing leave, I'm calling the police. You're going to jail forever. If you walk out that effing door, you're going to jail forever. On the night of June 7th, did you punch your wife? I did not punch my wife. Thank you. No further questions. Mr. Merkel's cross-examination. Mr. Villa, I'm going to show you what's been previously marked as People's Exhibit Number 6. Okay, don't. The bedroom that we're referring to is marked A and D in red. Where is Anne? She's... Here, I was here on this side. I climb off, I come around here. She goes to get up and her arm shoots off. And when that arm goes, her body, like being top heavy, just right into the dresser. How did she land? Into the dresser and then with her butt sticking up in the air. You mentioned she landed against the dresser. When she hit it, she kind of bounced and then landed, you know. Right, now you're indicating as you're sitting there kind of off leaning to your right. Yeah, okay, remember, she goes this way. Now you're indicating off to your left. Well, like that diagram shows right there, where she went off is where she went off. Mr. Villa, isn't it true that in 1981, 1982, and 1997, you were convicted in three separate felony cases of theft offenses? Yes. Mr. Villa, thank you. You're welcome, sir. at this time you may deliver the people's argument. The defendant is guilty. You may infer that the defendant has the disposition to batter his significant other. You may infer that he did what he's been accused of on June 7th of 2001. Anna and the defendant got into an argument and it was over sex. Even the defendant will admit to that. He would have us believe, however, that this was all her idea. What we know, though, is that he wanted her to orally copulate him and she didn't want to do it. She said no. And that was apparently a mistake because she ended up, yet again, being battered at the hands of this man. You don't have to even know that it's a crime to punch your wife. You might think, hey, you know, that's what you do when your wife isn't complying with your sexual demands. Well, ignorance of the law is no defense. What else do we know? Lauren and Jake testified that they were coming back now from getting some food. And what did they hear? A scream. And they run up into the condominium. They look at her. She's crying. She has blood under her mouth smudged around her nose. And Via has finally gotten to the point where she has said, enough of this. Tell the defendant, enough. And the way you do that is to return a guilty verdict. Unfortunately, in today's world, crime is everywhere. You read about it in the papers, you see it on TV, you hear about it on the radio. As a result of that, we all have certain biases. As an example, if you're walking down the street and you see a police officer throw a guy up against the wall, the first thing you think is that guy did something wrong. You didn't see what happened, but yet you've made a determination that that person is guilty of something. You can't do that now. Your job is to look at the evidence they presented in this case. She told you she was drinking that day and taking Xanax. She tells the officer, she tells her daughter, and she told us she was covered in blood. Deputy Stroll, did you find blood on the carpet? No. Bathroom? No. Towels? No. Did you notice a towel on the couch that Ann says was there? No. See any blood on her clothes? No. 
Look in the back for blood on her clothes? No. Look in the bedroom where she was punched twice and then walked on a white carpet out to the living room? And told him, well, I changed my shirt. And did you tell him? It's in the back. Do you want to see it? You know what she said? Who would do that? That was her answer. Who would do that? I don't know. Somebody tell him the truth. First, she had a wet washcloth. Then she said it was a dry towel. Does it really make a difference? Probably not, because she didn't have either. Would you rely on her story in the most important of your affairs without hesitation? I would hope not. Thank you. Okay, it's out of your hands now. Yeah. Jury gets to decide. Yeah. I'm just tired. I'm tired of it. Regardless of what happens, you're moving on, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Regardless, okay? Worst case scenario, not guilty. Mm -hmm. Okay, which means we're looking at best a parole violation. Right. You just, you've had enough. Yeah. You're not going back. No. Okay, just gonna be safe, stay away, mm -hmm. and move on. You're comfortable with that, right? Yeah. Good. Versus Thomas Shearbaum, counts 11, 12, 13, and 14, each allege that on or about October 9, 2000, you assaulted another person with a semi-automatic firearm. That person is Jeanette Shearbaum in count 11, John Shearbaum in count 12, Julie Shearbaum in count 13. As alleged in count 11, how do you plead, sir? Guilty. As alleged in count 12, how do you plead? Guilty. As alleged in count 13, how do you plead? Guilty. Jeanette, it's Stacy. Hi, Stacy. Hi, it's a done deal. Really? He pled. 41 years, five strikes. So it's all signed and done? It's signed and done. Are you OK? Yeah. I just can't believe that it happened so fast. Can he get paroled or anything? He won't be eligible for parole for 34 years and nine months. So you should not have to worry about Tom for the next 35 years. Wow. Okay, Dave. All right, it was a Thanks pleasure much. meeting you. Oh, you too. I'll be in touch with you. Okay. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. I'm really happy for you. Thanks, Sam. So I know that you were really scared, and now you can live in peace, and the kids can live in peace. Now we can all feel safe. Yeah, exactly. Do you feel safe now, Julie? No. You don't no, feel I safe haven't. yet? No. How come? Because it's not just him. What is it? Other people can be like that, too. It's Kurt. We have a verdict. What is it? We don't know yet. They're not going to read the verdict until 3.30. So if you want to be there, um, be here before 3.30, and we can all go down together. OK, I'm coming to the fifth floor to see you. OK, we'll walk down together. OK, thank Drive you. Drive safely. Bye. What's up? Are they still doing the readback? No, verdict. Verdict? They're going to read it at 3.30. Oh, my. Why not now? I know, they're torturing us. What's that? Good luck, my friend. Everyone rise, please. Department 12, the Superior Court is now in session. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's the court's understanding that the jury has arrived at a verdict. If you would please uh, hand the binder containing the verdict form to the bailiff for my review. Clerk will please read the verdict. In the Superior Court of the State of California, the people of the State of California plaintiff versus Michael Villa defendant. We, the jury in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Michael Villa, guilty of the crime of corporal injury to spouse in violation of Penal Code Section 273.5, subsection A, as charged in count one of the information. Sentencing uh, hearing will be ordered set for Friday, December uh, 14th. Pending that hearing, uh, Mr. Bia is ordered held without bail.
Your Honor, he's been in the criminal justice system since 1974. He was 11 years old. Petty thefts, stolen cars, commercial burglary, residential burglary, false imprisonment, robbery, evading the police, felony domestic violence, assault with a deadly weapon, felony threats. Those are the charges he's been arrested for. The three strikes law was written for people like this defendant. Yes, this case standing alone, if we're talking only about the June 7, 2001 event, it would have been filed as a misdemeanor, a bloody nose. However, it was filed as a spousal abuse with prior convictions. The only way these people are going to be safe and the community is going to be safe is if we take him off the streets for an extended period of time. That's what Three Strikes is about, and that's what the people ask the courts to do. Mr. Lito? Okay. Thank you. Welcome. I am 78 years old. I fought in World War II. I had quadruple bypass surgery. I buried both of my parents, but almost nothing, nothing in my life as compared to the anguish and pain I have experienced watching my precious daughter, Anne, under his long-term abuse. Well, I don't know if I can continue here. I mean, I got to finish this. You have broken bread with me, and you've looked me in the eye and sworn to me, man to man, that you would do right by my daughter and her children. You lied. You lied to me. He is not an honorable man. He is a violent man. Such a man should serve the appropriate amount of time to keep him from ever having a chance to harm my daughter and others again. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Earl. Your Honor, at this time, Mr. Villa wishes to address the court as well. Very well. Your Honor, I never terrorized my wife. My wife, at any point, if she was afraid of me, could have called my parole officer. He would have picked me up in two seconds flat. And I'm not denying that we had physical confrontation. We had physical confrontation, mutual combat. But I wouldn't viciously beat my wife. My life is in your hands, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Villa. Uh, it has uh, been uh, the court's experience in domestic violence cases that there are two sides, at least, to every story. But Mr. Bia can in no way clothe himself in the garb of a victim. It is uh, the court's belief that uh, Mr. Bia has uh, used her as uh, the equivalent of a human punching bag. Mr. Bia is ordered committed to the Department of Corrections uh, for the term prescribed by law. 25 years to life. All right, thank you. You're in recess. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's fantastic. That has to feel so good. It is a relief. 